finally having a chance to, to, to make it here. Uh, it was a great conference. I was here two. I was at the conference two years ago in in Seoul. I just loved it, and I was, I'm really mad at myself for not going last year in Sydney because that sounds like a great great place. So I just it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about uh, some work. At, uh, about the learning approach to corporate governance. Uh, it's based on actually a chapter that Ben Hermelin and I wrote for this handbook that we are editing that don't, doesn't exist yet, but we're hoping it will exist by the end of 2017, if not early 2018. Um, we still have a few, cha a few chapters we're waiting for. Uh, for uh, but basically, this is, this is a chapter, but you can download it from my website in SSRN. It's co-authored with, with Ben. Um, so basically, uh, the paper is about how to think about corporate governance. So the traditional way to think about corporate governance is as, as an agency problem. So, so the, the definition of corporate governance, the most well known is by Schleifer and Vishni, where they talk about uh, corporate governance being the, the way in which suppliers assure themselves of getting a return on the, their capital. And so most governance literature focuses on governance as a way of controlling agency problems. And, and so in other words, preventing stealing from managers, motivating managers to work hard and everything. Um, and so certainly, uh, I, I certainly have can be, go along with that and have subscribed to that. Uh, and I think that there's a lot to the idea of, of agency problems be, being important, okay? However, the way, um, I, probably a lot of you have had this experience as well, where you think uh, of governance as, as managers trying to steal from shareholders and all of this, and then you actually meet a few managers. And basically, every, you know, I've been doing this for a few years, and I've met managers and talked to them, and every single one of them I've met is, is extremely smart, hardworking, nice, and trying to do their very best for shareholders, although they mess up sometimes, right? They sometimes don't know quite the best way. Sometimes they're the wrong fit. Sometimes they pick the right, the wrong strategy. Sometimes they hire the wrong employees or come up with the wrong products. But it's not because uh, they're trying to steal money. I mean, you know, maybe some some managers do. I, I I've never met the current president, but, uh, but, but basically, uh, but you know, but most of the ones that I've met have. Um, have you know been trying to do their best for, for shareholders, and, um, and and so basically what they're trying to do is to learn how to govern better and how to maximize profits. And um, and I th I guess the thesis of my talk today is that much of corporate governance uh, can be understood by understanding this this process by which they learn how to maximize profits. And so that's kind of how uh, the thesis I say. So this, this idea has been formalized in the academic literature in these models that are called learning or assessment models. And so, uh, and certainly there have been uh, a number of uh, ways that this has been applied in governance and in other fields. Uh, but I don't think it has become kind of a central way of thinking about corporate governance as much as it should by, by our profession. And so, so much of my recent work has used this sort of framework as a way to understand corporate governance. And so what I'll do is kind of summarize a bunch of different papers that use this approach and sort of make the pitch that there's a lot to be learned here. Uh, and so basically the way I'll structure this talk is explain the basics of how learning can affect contracting and then illustrate some examples of how you can apply this idea from, um, from, from my, my own papers and some other people's papers. Um, so how does learning affect the governance of the firm. Okay, well, it does in a, in a number of different ways. Okay, first of all, it provides incentives for uh, managers to perform well. And they're indirect incentives, but that doesn't mean they're not unimportant incentives. But, uh, but it is definitely true that these, these incentives will be suboptimal in kind of the traditional principal agent way of thinking about optimality. Uh, it provides, it actually partially determines stock volatility, and I'll explain how that works in a second. So when management quality is uncertain, what happens is that news about the firm conveys information about management, which then magnifies stock price movements. And so I'll present some evidence showing exactly how that works in a, in a, in a few minutes. Um, it partially determines the cost of borrowing. When management style is uncertain, then the management, what happens is they raise their assessment of the management risk associated with the firm, and that gets priced into the borrowing that firms do, okay? And so the, the, these are all implications of the market's learning about management. Um, then uh, it affects management compensation. Well, why? Because ex post, 
it means that when, when the learning is positive, and you know, then then the higher uh, assessment leads to more pay. Uh, when the but ex ante, even before you assess uh, the managers, well, the fact that they're going to be assessed affects the optimal contract with between the managers and the firm, and and, and that affects the uh, the level of compensation that management must get. Um, then I uh, explains the hiring and firing decisions of managers. Clearly, when you assess management, you and you assess them negatively, then that affects the the, the, the the firing. And it also explains management entrenchment. So when CEOs are judged to be un, unusually good, then what happens is they acquire bargaining power, which they then use to influence the board selection. And and I've got a number of uh, some papers along along those lines. And so anyway, I mean that, that to me that seems like an awful lot to be you know, coming out of this one basic idea about how uh, the, the, the management is being assessed and the process by which it's being assessed. So, um, so the idea began in the 1980s with two of our giants, uh, Fama and Holmstrom, and uh, it actually began out of a fight that they have. So you, you know, much, much of what we do, it seems like we talk about it and discuss is, is uh, we argue with each other, we disagree, and, there, and sometimes something positive comes through it. So basically, Gene Fama wrote this very famous paper in 1980 that argued that assessment together with career concerns provides incentives for managers to perform well, and he basically argued that that would put us at the first best and everything would be hunky-dory once you uh, have this, uh, this process in place. And then Holmstrom read this and decided that this was completely, uh, completely wrong. And he, what he did, what it led him to do, was to formalize this idea, and he created a whole class of models called signal jamming models that, that basically, uh, in those models, the market provides incentives through the learning process, and um, and then that leads to you know we formalize the idea in in Fama, and, and what happens is in the Holmstrom model is that learning provides positive incentives from the uh, but they are suboptimal, and then of course what happened last fall was that for this paper and, and uh, several others, uh, Holmstrom won the Nobel Prize. So, so I have to put a picture of that is Holmstrom right there. Yes, yes, so, yes so, and there he is. And he won it with, with Oliver Hart. And so, uh, so I had to, um, you know, a friend of mine posted it on Facebook. So you see the Facebook little thing there. And so I had to uh, copy it and add it to my, to my talk. And um, I, I just love the picture on Oliver's uh, uh, face because I can't, he can't tell whether he's happy about be just winning a Nobel Prize or sad because he has to wear a tuxedo and he hates one. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, uh, okay, so anyway, so Holmstrom, Holmstrom paper, how does the model work? Okay, basically the way uh, the model works is that the market takes the profits as a signal of manager's ability, okay? And it, you, you know, basically decides how much of a signal it ought to be based on what the prior ability, prior assessment of his ability is and how, uh, how informative the signal is about his ability. And, and then basically the market, or the firm, what the firm does is it pays the manager based on his inferred ability, not his actual ability, because his actual ability is un unknown. And so uh, what happens is that the, mar the manager has an incentive because he knows that he's being paid based on what people, how, how good they think he's going to be, they, 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 he, he's going to try and influence how good they think he's going to be, and that's what provides him the incentives to work hard. Now, the, pro what the problem for the manager is because we're in a rational expectations world, the market knows exactly how extra hard he's going to work to it's the jam the signal, and it subtracts that from their assessment of his ability. So it doesn't actually succeed in jamming the signal, but it's nonetheless the fact that he must try to jam the signal, because if he doesn't try, then they'll, then he'll, they'll assume he's, he's below average, even if he's actually pretty good. And so therefore, uh, that's what provides incentives for him to to do well, okay? And so in other words, his effort comes not because of direct pay for performance, is how we usually think about incentives working, but it's really an after effect of the fact that the market's evaluating his performance, and that's what, uh, what leads to the incentives. So, so in other words, regardless of the source of this, though, it does provide some, in, some what I call indirect incentives to create profits. So they're not direct because they're not, it's not that somebody's going to say, if you do, do better, we'll give you a little extra money, but it's the fact that he, he wants the world to think of him as good, and so therefore he works really, really hard on that. 
and that the, pay, the direct paper performance is kind of inconsequential. Um, so what determines this? So and the, the thing about this paper and this literature is that everyone who hears it says, yes, of course, these are important. Right? But, but it's actually hard because you know, we think about our own lives and clearly uh, what motivates young faculty is not, is not the, whether they get a 1% or 2% raise, but the fact that it's going to affect their, uh, their whole career prospects is how, how, how well they do. Uh, and I think many, many professions are, are, are like that. Um, but what determines the size of the incentives, you know, if you think about, so we would all agree that these are important, but actually measuring them and quantifying them is, is not so easy. And so, in principle, what would determine the size of the incentives? Well, one, the time left in his career. So the longer he has, the more important a good reputation is. And then, um, secondly, the informativeness about profits and the amount that ability can translate into to future profits. So this is, a, this is actually a key, key thing. So in other words, what really matters for how strong the incentives are is how, how much profits tell a firm about how good he is, and also how much their prior uh, assessment is, or how accurate their prior assessment is. So in other words, if they know for sure that he's really good, then if he has a bad year, it's not a big deal, right? If he's just starting out, and they don't know for sure how good he is, then a good signal could raise their assessment a lot, which would raise his outside options a lot, which would then raise his pay a lot. And so, so, and so, the, and I should mention that there's a very, very one, a wonderful paper by Jeremy Stein where he applies this idea to myopia, and basically the way his his model works is that when uh, the managers decide between short-term profits and long-term profits, well, it turns out that short-term profits are more informative about their ability than long-term profits. So management will sort of push up their, their investments so as to create short-term profits versus long-term profits, and it's all, it all works from the same principle. So all, that paper just came right out of the Holmstrom model, and if you read the Holmstrom paper and the Stein paper, you know, the mechanics are all basically similar, and it's a very, very important paper by Stein that uh, it's really, came, again, it came out of the whole debate between Fama and Holmstrom. Um, Discount rates. Well, discount rates clearly uh, affect it because, because what you, the way uh, indirect incentives, it works through future compensation. So the higher the discount rate, the less that, that matters. Um, and so basically, none of these factors are likely to be associated with optimal incentives, where optimal is what you would write, it, what, you know, what you learn in a, in a PhD course in, uh, in principal agent theory, where you would just kind of write out the optimal contract. Then, um, and so in other words, how do we decide how large they are? Well, it's actually very difficult to know, right? So, so in other words, to measure them, you would want to uh, require knowing the manager's outside options, how the outside options change with the firm performance, and how that affects his pay at the current firms. And if you think about any, real, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world's businesses, you don't know any of that stuff, right? So how would you go as an outsider and me measure these outside incentives? And well, it turns out that one industry for which you actually can measure it is one that we kind of, as a profession, know, know pretty well. Um, and that's the money management industry. Because what, what do we know about the money management industry? Well, we can observe firm performance, right? We can observe the fund performance. We can observe the inflows to the fund. And so we can estimate the sensitivity of inflows to performance. And so that will, what that will tell us is how the market responds to updates about his ability. And the other thing we know is we actually know the compensation system. So we don't exactly know what any individual managers pay, but we know the fee structure of the fund that you're thinking about. And so to the extent that the management gets a good chunk of those fees, we actually know um, how much the, uh, the, the, the management updates, uh, the, how much the, uh, his pay will affect, will, will depend on the inflows to the fund, which are a function of the performance of the fund. And so that's the way the, the process works. And so, so what we do is, uh, you know, I have a couple papers where I estimate it. And, and so the question is, you know, whenever you think about measuring anything, your first reaction is say, well, is this a big number or is this a small number? And then, of course, somebody raises their hand and says, relative to what? And the answer in this thing 
in, in this setting is whether to what is the direct incentives. Now, one of the things we know about the money management industry is that this is an industry for which we probably tell, all tell our students that the, the direct incentives are incredibly big, right? So in, in the hedge fund, you would get 20% profit sharing once you pass the high water mark in the private equity industry again it's a 20% uh, carry and so 20% of the profits is way 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 more than you know 99.9% .9 of the world's uh, employees right i guess if you own your own business you get 100% of profits so most people you know you know don't get nearly 20% of profits so so what we do, I have, I have two papers. Uh, one is with uh, Jun Chang, Burke Sensoy, and Leo Stern. And the other is with John Paul Lim and Burke, Burke Sensoy. What we, we do is we go and we actually estimate the extent to which you can measure these indirect incentives, sort of quantify what Holmstrom was talking about in, um, in, uh, in his paper. So, so in other words, I, I don't know if you can read this, but I, I, I'm going to sort of skip the, the the, the mechanics of the calculation, but basically what we do in each of the papers is we estimate how sensitive the, um, the fund inflows are to performance, and then we just go through the calculation of suppose you have an extra dollar coming into the fund, what fraction of it goes to the, the management, okay? And so that what we do is for the whole, whole, uh, whole so if you look right up here, um, for the indirect versus direct. So in other words, relative to the 20% direct profit share, you know, the carried interest in private equity, the indirect incentives for an average fund is 63%. Uh, so it's actually quite large. And the next thing we do is we compute what we call the Jensen Murphy B. So if you, you must have all read the Jensen Murphy famous paper where they go for every dollar of wealth created or every thousand, way they did it was every thousand dollars of wealth created for shareholders, the CEO will get an extra two cents or something. That's the, those are, that's the order of number depending on which version of the calculation you get. Well, for the private equity funds, for every dollar of wealth going to the investors, the, um, the management gets 29 cents. That's which is quite, quite large, right? Uh, and, and that's counting both direct and indirect. For hedge funds, it's even bigger. So for hedge funds, the, um, the indirect versus the direct. The indirect is, you know, hedge funds you think, oh, these hedge fund managers have such great incentives because they get 20% profit share. Well, it turns out the indirect incentives for an average hedge fund are three times as big. So in other words, for every, uh, for every dollar that comes in, the, what, the way, what happens is for every, you know, when you do a little bit better than average, that so increases the inflows into your fund, which then gets, you know, and then as, over your lifetime, that translates into, uh, you know, a huge amount. So the Jensen Murphy B is 66 cents. So for every dollar of wealth you return to your investors, an initial dollar, you end up keeping 66 cents. That's not, that's not of the dollar, that's the, your total wealth goes up by 66 cents. So they still get a dollar, but, but I mean, you made, so it's, a, it's an enormous thing, okay? So the next thing we do in these papers is we, we look at how the sequence or the age of the fund. Well, why do we do that? Well, if you have a new fund, then basically uh, what the, whole, the principle of informative says is that what? That you, know, you have a low, you have a very diffuse prior about the manager's ability. And so therefore, given a signal, you would update your, what Bayes' law says, you should update your assessment a lot. And so, uh, what, so what you would expect to happen is that the indirect incentive should be relatively more important for younger managers and younger funds. And indeed, and so if you go and estimate these equations and do the calculations, you basically get much bigger effects for smaller and newer funds than for older funds, which is exactly consistent with this idea. So, um, oh yeah. So we, we present here in this picture, uh, for, for the private equity example, that for fund two, the indirect to direct is 47%. For fund three, it's uh, 32. The reason why they're low, they're both lower than 62, is it just turns out there's a lot of fund zeros, fund ones, and fund uh, fund ones out there, and there's a huge effect for fund one. Uh, for private, for hedge funds, it's even bigger. So that for a brand new fund, the um, the, in, the indirect incentives are five and a half times as big as the direct incentives. So in other words, if the direct incentives is a 20% profit share, then that means for a direct, for, for, an, for a brand new fund, you, for every dollar that's uh, returned, they get this enorm, enormous amount, even more than a dollar. Actually, the Jensen Murphy B is 
uh, 60 cents. So it's, uh, so the, so it's very, very, very big. Okay. The final thing we do is we look at the scalability. Well, why is scalability an important factor? Well, in other words, if you're thinking about how much performance translates into extra money, what matters is how you can scale the strategy. So if you're in the money management industry, right, if you are, uh, let's just take a, a private equity example. So if you are uh, Sequoia or Kleiner or one of the A-list venture capital funds, they what they do is they cap their funds at 600 or 700 million dollars, even though they could make 20, they could, they could take 20 or 30 times more than that uh, because there's so many people who want to invest in Kleiner and Sequoia, it's just that what they do is they, they write small checks to startups and, and sort of nurse them into a healthy company, and so they can't, they can't scale their operation. They only have so many partners, only partners can have so many different funds, and so as a result, uh, they, they, it's not a very scalable business, and so as a result, the indirect is relatively small compared to the, it's still big, but it's small compared to direct incentives, whereas in buyouts, right, that's a very scalable business, and so if you are good at buying out little companies, you can get raise more and more money, and eventually if you become Blackstone or TPG, you're raising 20 billion with a B, US dollars, not Taiwanese dollars at a, at a, at a, at a time, and, um, and so you can, it can be enormous. So in other words, if you establish to the world that you are very good early on in the buyout industry, it can be extremely profitable, and so as a result, the, the indirect is even larger than, than the direct in this uh, for buyouts. And the same thing is true for hedge funds. It's, you know, it's harder to classify the hedge funds, but they do have certain strategies. And so, it, if you are in the strategy of a merger arbitrage, for example, there are only so many mergers, so that's not as scalable as if you're sort of in long short equities, which you can just kind of do do all day long. And so, so it turns out that again. The, if you, and, the, 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 and so if you go and re-estimate the equations and redo the calculations, you get a much bigger effect for the not capacity constrained ones than for the capacity constrained ones. Okay. So those are some of our, some of our estimates of how big uh, indirect versus direct are. And, and just I mean, just if you want, again, if you want to quantify them, even relative to the high direct incentives in this industry, the indirect incentives are extreme, extremely large and extreme, extreme, extremely important. Um, the next uh, take idea is about how learning affects volatility. So, uh, so the idea is the following. Suppose you have two firms and uh, they have the same stream of cash flow news, but one has a CEO who is well known and one has a CEO who's brand new. And then when you have the cash flow news, it comes along, then and basically, the, the cash flow news affects your assessment of firm profitability. And for that one, it doesn't really matter who the CEO is, right? The, the, if it's good news, the stock of profitability will go up. If it's bad news, profitability will go down. But there's a second channel as well. And the second channel works through the news and its effect on the, the, your assessment of the management's ability. So in other words, if there's a brand new management team and they do above average, then the, the appropriate inference is if they have a good performance is to update your assessment of how good the management team is and therefore you will update the, your assessment of how high future profits are going to be. And so on the other hand, if you have a well-known management team and they have above average performance, you don't update your assessment as much about the well-known management team and so you wouldn't uh, assess the stock, the stock wouldn't go up as much. And so. Uh, what I, I have is a paper uh, that came out a few years ago with, with, with Yi Hui Pan and Tracy Wong, and we test the implications of this idea. And so we find a number of findings, uh, based, I'll summarize them here and then I'll show you a, a few of them. Um, we find that uh, return volatility declines over a CEO's tenure. The, and as predicted, we have a formal model in the paper, which is based on a, a very good paper by Pastor and Berenice that you, you probably have seen. Uh, and we find that the, the decline is con predicted by the model is you see the decline is convex, which is faster in early periods than in later periods. The volatility, and, and, and also we also find that the volatility of the stock price reaction is uh, has a convex decline of the CEO tenure. Okay. Um, we have cross-sectional ability of predictions about volatility. We find that the learning curve is steepest when the initial uncertainty is the pro is the highest. So in other words. When the, there's uh, more uncertainty a priori, 
than what we see in the data about the manager, than what we see in the, uh, in the stock data is that you see a bigger decline in volatility over, uh, over time. And we also uh, find that the learning curve is steepest when firm specific news is more informative about ability. Okay. And what we, we find in the, the um, we have some estimates in the paper, and we, we show that, or our estimates suggest that the uncertainty about ability explains actually quite a substantial fraction of overall stock price volatility, a 22 to 29 percent of it. And so, so in other words, this, this is not an inconsequential thing we're talking about. The learning about management is actually quite an important thing in not just you know, picking management, but also understanding the, the um, equity, uh, equity movements of the firm. So uh, here, here are some pictures. So basically, the, um, we have three measures of volatility in the paper. We look at the option implied volatility. So in other words, that's what you get when you back, take it out of the Black-Scholes formula. We have idiosyncratic volatility and realized volatility, and all of them follow the same picture. So in other words, what you see is, well, I'll show up here, is that at, um, at time zero, when there's a management change, there's a spike in volatility, and then you sort of see it decline in this down, downward level, and by year three, it's kind of fairly constant. And so, so, and then when there's a new manager, he comes in and there's a new spike in volatility and it declines over time. Um, and so some regressions are here. I, I won't put too many regressions up here, but basically uh, there's, uh, you see that, so in this one you see in year one, uh, and basically what you have on the left-hand side is the volatility, and on the right-hand side you have tenure in year one, tenure in year two, and you see that it's a, a much bigger decline in year one, a coefficient of minus 0.6, and in year two it's minus 0.2, and in year three it's not significant, and some sort of thing it is. We, it's, but basically, no matter which way we look at the data, you see a, a, a big decline in the first year, and then it sort of levels off and it follows, follows these pictures here. Okay, and then, um, we also do cross-sectional tests because basically, if, you know, again, if you want to think that this empirical relation about equity, uh, move, equity prices is really coming from the management, then it ought to, learning about the management, then it ought to be the case that if you look at the characteristics of the management, they, that, that should, they should line up. So in other words, we look at when there's an, a CEO from the outside, well, presumably when there's a CEO from the outside, as, I mean, how many, okay, well, plenty of time, huh? when the CEO's from the outside, then um, there's presumably more uncertainty about him, right? So therefore, you learn faster about him, so you see a sharper decline in volatility. When there's an heir apparent, on the other hand, an heir apparent is you know, the guy who's the president, and so presumably he, there's not as much uncertainty about his ability and the policies he's going to do, uh, you see that a, a less of a decline. Okay? When the CEO is younger, you see a larger decline, because again, there's presumably more uncertainty about a younger CEO than an older CEO. When a CEO has a lot of previous positions, you see, again, less of a decline because there's presumably more known about the CEO. And when there's more analysts following the company, again, that, that means to, to us that, that means there's probably a more informative signal about the firm's profits. And so therefore, you, you see a sharp, again, if you think that everything comes back to the same uh, Bayes' Law principle that Holmstrom laid out in his paper, that, that when you see a sharper signal about the firm's uh, profits from the higher number of analysts, the bigger decline you have. When the forecast error is larger, you see less of a signal. So basically, this is a, these are the cross-sectional predictions that you see there. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's the um, that paper. Now, Tracy and Yihui and I actually have three papers. I'm not, there's one I'm not going to talk about because that is more about the other, the agency view of uh, uh, about managers. But this this new paper, or the most recent paper, which I actually presented in Seoul at this very conference two two, two years ago, uh, is uh, is about how the uncertainty about the management adds to the overall risk that's perceived about the market. And it turns out that that feeds into the cost of borrowing that the firm faces when they borrow. And so what we do in, the, in, the set, in this, uh, this paper is we should look at how the cost of debt varies with the uncertainty about the management. Okay? And so uh, over time what happens is the market learns about management and it lowers borrowing costs the firm faces. So the cost of borrowing actually rises at the time of turnover and declines in the CEO's uh, time in office, mostly in the first three years. And so what we do in this paper is we look at C spreads on CDSs, new loans, and new public debt. And so we find actually a substantial decline over this period. Uh, the CDS spread declines by 34 basis points, 
and the loans and bonds that declined by a little bit less. Okay. And um, a similar pattern following, and we, we, we looked at it, everything's true for exogenous turnovers. You know, of course, it, this, is, this is 2017 in corporate finance, so half of the paper is devoted to uh, the discussions of an endogeneity and causality. But basically, all these results are true, are true um, in regardless of which turnovers you look at, whether you look at deaths or fires, or we do it many different ways. So, um, okay, so the basic pattern is this. So right before turnover, the, uh, the CDS spread is a measure of the overall risk of the firm. And so we, we focus much of the analysis on that. And you see that the CDS spread rises by about 30 basis points to the point of departure and then declines over time. To, and, and at 36 months after, after inauguration, um, it's about the same level as it was you know, before the, the, the new CEO took over. So the regressions look like this. So basically, you have the spread. Um, and you can look at, oh, we have, we have do, do it lots of ways in the paper. We can include all, the whole tenure of the CEO, or you can just lose the first three years. And in either case, you see this uh, coefficient here. And what this means is that there's three uh, one hundredths of a basis point per day decline. So these are days. And so if you add up the, the basis points per day over the three years, it ends up being 34 basis points over the um, over the three of the first three years of tenure. Okay. Um, now again, we, we also look cross sectionally in this paper, and we we'll see that um, it, it, this effect is bigger for non heir apparent CEOs. Again, when there's more to be learned about the CEO, when there's outsider CEOs, when there's young CEOs, and we also have some results for CFOs, and that it doesn't much matter whether the CFO is for from the outside or the inside. And so here are the magnitudes. So basically, in the full sample, there's a, there's a decline of 34 basis points in, in CDSs, and 20 for loans, and 23 for bonds. And it's, it's larger for um, when there's higher prior uncertainty about the CDO. It's also larger when the, when the debt is riskier. So again, this is, these are sort of the cross-sectional implications. Um, all right, so uh, another, so that's sort of the whole learning and, uh, and, and capital markets. Now, my, my co-author, Jen Hermelin, has a, has a model in which boards can learn about managers and can monitor or fire them. And so the way his model works is that you, you see that the more uh, diligent the board, the more risk-averse managers must be compensated uh, ex ante for that. So in other words, when, when the board is going to be uh, assessing and potentially firing the manager, then it's, given the manager is risk-averse, you have to compensate him ex ante for that. And so th what he argues in that paper, this is one, this is one explanation for the rise, uh, that active boards are one of, one of the reasons why there has been a rise in management compensation over recent years. And so uh, there's a link there. So, and, um, and so Ben and I together, we have a paper uh, that was, you may have seen it was, uh, it's, it's fairly well known by now, it's, uh, it was published in 1998, and we, we, call, we call it a joint endogeneity uh, model. And basically, that way that model works is the board receives a signal and it updates the prior about the CEO's ability. Then what happens is they negotiate with respect to a filling of the vacancies on the board. And the CEO's a bit, what, ha, what, what determines uh, how the board evolves over time and how his pay evolves over time is the CEO's um, bargaining ability with the board, which is a function of the, um, the board's assessment of his ability. And so, so then what happens is the new board then goes and decides how to intensely monitor the CEO. And so what happens is that inframarginal CEOs go and select more friendly directors and therefore influence future monitoring. And so, so what happens in this model is that learning about ability affects a bunch of stuff. It affects the management turnover, it affects board selection, and it affects management entrenchment. Um, and so I always, whenever I talk about this paper, I always give the example of Michael Eisner because um, those of us who went to school and were doing corporate uh, governance research in the 80s, and looking around the room, there aren't too many of, uh, uh, you know, Alexander's not quite as old, old as I am, but he's a, uh, yeah, so at the time when I started doing this, Michael Eisner was always like the example of the golden boy CEO. And he was always, the, you know, they would, he, at Fortune Magazine, Fortune, they always have to have the ranking of the best CEOs and the worst CEOs, right? And so at the time, he was like number one, right? Because he was always paid the most. And what, why? Because he like revitalized Disney, right? 
because he basically, uh, for ever, when Walt Disney died, they, they spend the next 25 years trying to figure out what Walt would have done as opposed to what's actually the good thing to do. And then, then Michael Eisner comes in, they start making Beauty and the Beast and movies like that, and they made all this money. The stock went way up. And then what happened was, you know, he, according to our model, right, what happens is he, um, he, he was very inframarginal relative to the next best, uh, best CEO. And so he was able to stack his the board, and he really did. He put his uh, personal attorney on the board. He put his daughter's kindergarten teacher, which I guess if you're at Disney has some relation to what, understanding what kids want. Uh, and then he, was, uh, he went from being the very top of the list of the best CEOs, then he was the most entrenched CEO in, in, in possible. And so what Ben and I would argue is that these are not unrelated events. It was a fact that he was the very best CEO and considered the very best CEO is reason why he was able to entrench himself and become a very uh, uh, not so great CEO and he was eventually forced out after this. So um, anyway, so that kind of illustrates uh, I think the the, the, way, the dynamics of the way that model works. So uh, again, in the future, I guess I um, in the future, let me sum up a little bit. Uh, so in other words, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot of stuff that gets explained by this basic Bayesian learning process where, um, where people are updating their assessments and governance, I think, is more than about managers trying to steal from shareholders. It's really about managers trying to figure out how to best maximize the value. And they, they, the board goes and they pick a, a person to be a CEO and a CFO, and sometimes they turn out to be great, and sometimes they turn out not to be so great. And so, uh, so in other words, what I think there's a lot of work to be done in explaining what uh, features of governance, uh, you know, can be explained by learning versus agency. There's not nearly enough empirical work. One of the things that I've learned in doing these empirical papers I talk about is that the learning models they they actually are much better for doing empirical work than than, than many other models we do because they've got all these different predictions, right? So that the thing about a learning models is it, it predicts that you know it depends on how precise the signal is and how precise how how uh, precise is the the prior distribution of the CE of the, the whoever's being evaluated and it has time series predictions that over time the uh, the update should be larger early on and they should uh, they should get smaller over time and so that there's a lot of predictions of the models that actually lend themselves very nicely to empirical work um, and the other thing that I want to uh, to, to talk about just at the very end is that how you know one of the things about learning is that the traditional way to do it is to um, just kind of assume that everyone follows Bayes law so so if you have if you need a book to read for uh, over over the summer read Danny Kahneman's uh, wonderful book that sort of changes the way you think about things and one of the things that I took away from that book was that people don't follow Bayes' law, right? So that there, the psychologists in, in every university in the world have done experiments and showing lots of things. And one of the things that they consistently show is that people don't follow Bayes' law, but that they update their priors too much about given a signal. And so the, the famous example is, uh, is this basketball paper, where uh, basically they show that you know regardless of what um, what uh, whether a guy makes a shot uh, this time, that's actually very, if you look at the data, you know, if you make three shots in a row, if, if Stephen Curry makes three shots in a row, that's actually, looking at the data, that's very uninformative of whether he's going to make the next shot. Now, that's not the way people perceive it, right? If he makes three shots in a row, then everyone in the whole stadium assumes that the next five of them are going to go in, even though they're not. If you actually look at the data, they're not. And so, um, so that basically what, what, what that means in terms of Bayes' law is that everyone updates their assessment too much given a signal. Well, how does this relate to what I'm talking about? Well, if you think back to the regressions I just showed you, uh, the effects were huge, right? So in other words, when um, a hedge fund has a high profits this year, right, and especially when there's a new manager, everyone assumes that he's the next Warren Buffett, right? And so this money just comes flowing in, and so, his, so in other words, the inflows are extremely sensitive to performance, 
And I think that part of that has to do with our, the nature of human frailties and the fact that people naturally overinterpret signals as being too informative about, um, about his ability. And how does that translate to incentives? Well, that's what, it's the, it's, the reason why those numbers were so big wasn't because there's anything weird about the calculations. It's just simply, if you go and you run a regression of inflows on performance for any industry you want, uh, mutual funds are smaller, but hedge funds and private equity funds, you get these huge numbers. Well, why do you get these huge numbers? Because that's what the data suggests, right? That when you do better, you know, it's very simple for an institutional investor to switch from uh, one hedge fund to another. So if Jay Reader's hedge fund underperforms and Neil Pearson's does well, they will immediately take the money out of Jay's, stick it in Neil's. It's, it's a pretty trivial calculation. And even though that it, it's most likely random, random choice, but uh, no, Neil says no. Neil's really much smarter than Jay, in fact. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so uh, you know. They, uh, you know, but basically, uh, what that's the way people perceive it, and I think, um, I think, and I have no idea how to do this, but I think that understanding the way uh, this uh, behavioral uh, implications, uh, the way the way people misperceive signals, is going to affect the learning process, which affects lots and lots of the implications of things that I've talked about in the last um, in the last 45 minutes. So I think that understanding how that works is likely to be a really um, really useful topic for, uh, for future research. So anyway, uh, I'm going to stop here. And I was told I had 45 minutes.